Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the education and workforce session of the American Solar Energy Society's 49th annual conference. My name is Elaine Hebert from the ACES board and I'm the moderator for this session. And if I seem shaken, just let me tell you that I experienced a small earthquake half an hour ago. So uh, on, on we go here. Um, my assistant moderator for this session is Cynthia Segura, an ACES intern. And thanks Cynthia for helping out. So our conference theme is Solar 2020, Renewable Energy Vision. And in this session, we'll get some diverse visions and hear about several programs on training the workforce for renewables, schooling young minds and older minds, and otherwise educating about photovoltaics, solar building design, fossil fuel use, and other topics for a range of audiences. This is ACES's first virtual conference. So before I introduce our speakers, let me cover a couple of basic logistics. To ask questions of the speakers, use the Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. There's also a separate function for chatting with all the attendees. So please don't place your questions for the speakers into the chat function, use the Q&A. We will pose one or two questions to each speaker after he or she finishes. If there's time left over after all the speakers have presented, we'll open up the floor. In addition, when this session ends in 90 minutes, we have a virtual chat room for this session, as well as all the sessions actually, that you can access through the networking lounge. And I've asked all the speakers to join us there to continue the discussion. All sessions are being recorded and will be available after the conference. And don't forget to sign up for the ACES call to action, hashtag mission possible, hashtag fossil free and flourishing, which you will see, you will see um, ways to sign up popping up on your screen during the conference. If you have any uncertainties about the logistics of this or other speaker sessions, type them into the chat and one of us will attempt to help you. All right, our first speaker is Susan Schleif. Susan, is a, she's a lifelong solar enthusiast and leads the K-12 education programs at the FSEC Energy Research Center at the University of Central Florida. Her mission is to increase energy literacy by educating K-16 teachers, students, and the public on the results of the research conducted at FSEC. She managed the SunSmart Schools Emergency Shelter Program that resulted in the installation of over one megawatt of combined solar electric power with battery backup on 118 Florida schools that double as emergency shelters. She led a team in starting the Energy Whiz program, which you're about to hear about. Here's Ms. Schleif. Good day, uh, this is the voice of Susan Schleif. I am the program lead for K-12 education at the FSEC Energy Research Center at the University of Central Florida. This presentation is Energy Whiz, where students shine and solar rains. By the end of this presentation, I hope that you will be convinced that something like Energy Whiz should and could be happening everywhere throughout the U.S. And we're happy to help make that happen. We will be covering quite a bit of territory in the short presentation. We will learn a little bit about FSEC and its K-12 education goals and programs. Then we'll get right into Energy Whiz, what it is, how it works, its benefits, and what lessons we've learned from doing this annual event. The Florida Solar Energy Center, or FSEC as it is more commonly called, is going through a slight name change. Its new name is the FSEC Energy Research Center at the University of Central Florida, which encompasses more of what we do. When FSEC was legislated into existence back in 1975, solar research and testing was its main focus. Now, although solar research is still an integral part of what FSEC does, over the years, FSEC's research has expanded to include electric vehicle and other alternative fuel transportation research, hydrogen, biofuels, and green building sciences research as well. FSEC's mission 
is to research and develop energy technologies that enhance Florida's and the nation's economy and environment and to educate the public, students, and practitioners on the results of the research. The K-12 education focus is the second part of the FSEC mission, which is on sharing the results of FSEC research and increasing energy literacy overall. What we would really like to see happen is for students, teachers, and the public to make more informed energy decisions based on science and to understand the impacts of their choices. I like to say that our strategy is somewhat steamy. We use science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics as the ingredients and tools to explore and understand energy and how it impacts the environment and the choices that we make. We have taken a tiered approach to K-12 energy education delivery. The foundation or first layer of our programming is the development of curriculum and materials that reflect FSEC research results and their relevance. And building on that is the second tier, which is professional development opportunities for educators. These can be workshops, seminars, summer institutes. It's a place where teachers, coaches, and after-school care providers can safely explore the curriculum. They're able to gain confidence in the content and apply those lessons with their students. And then the top tier is coordination of community and outreach events. And this does include Energy Wiz. This is the pinnacle, the culmination of months worth of student work. It's the icing on the cake, the candles. It's the, the big celebration of learning. Energy Wiz is the umbrella name for this forum that we created where multiple renewable energy competitions are happening all in the same day. What is really phenomenal about these activities is that it puts the spotlight on students and their work. They become the educators demonstrating and explaining their solar and other renewable energy projects. They're doing that for an audience of other students, teachers, community leaders, industry experts, scientists, you know, the public. Students really are the shining stars at Energy Wiz. Uh, now I'd like to share a video about Energy Wiz that will give you a much better sense of what it is. And as they say, you know, if a picture's worth a thousand words, then I guess this Energy Wiz video is probably worth 10,000 words or more. So here we go. Every spring, the FSEC Energy Research Center hosts Energy Wiz. This statewide event provides a forum for students to demonstrate their science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and artistic skills. It all started in 1992 with the Junior Solar Sprint and has grown to include the Energy Transfer Machine, Energy Innovations, Solar Energy Cookoff, and the Critter Comfort Cottage. Partnerships have expanded the event even more to include the Electrothon, an electric vehicle design and endurance race. Registration for all the events is the first order of business. Schools are checked in, cars are tested, weighed, and photographed. Solar cookers are set up for teams to begin cooking, and team displays for the Energy Innovations, Critter Comfort Cottage, and Electrothon are open for public viewing. All cars entered into the Junior Solar Sprint are evaluated on their innovative design, quality of construction, and unique materials used. The design process is also considered through examination of student design journals. Teams gather outside for the exciting head-to-head -head solar car race where students work as their own pit crew, repairing and improving their cars after each heat. The energy transfer machine requires building a Rube Goldberg type contraption of any size that uses the electrical energy produced by battery power in one or more steps of its operation. The goal is for the machine to complete a task in exactly one minute using a complex and unusual process. The team documents its successful run on video for their submission to Energy Wiz. 
teams are scored on the machine's precision, number of energy transfers completed, creativity, and communication skills. The Energy Innovations Competition challenges elementary, middle, and high school students to design, build, and market full-size demonstration products or artistic works that use renewable energy technologies as their power source and explore possible solutions to the problem of climate change. Developing their projects over the course of the school year, highlighting any type of renewable energy technology, teams showcase their unique product and marketing idea at FSEC's Energy Wiz. The Solar Energy Cook-Off tests students' engineering and culinary skills. Each team designs and builds a solar cooker, which they use to cook their original dish. Once their creation is cooked, the food is presented to the judges for tasting. Meals are graded on their appeal, taste, difficulty, and creativity. The latest addition to the Energy Wiz lineup is the Critter Comfort Cottage event. Students in grades 4 through 12 are challenged to design, build, and market their energy-efficient, environmentally friendly animal habitat. The day ends with an awards ceremony where all of the winning teams are recognized. For more information about Energy Wiz, please contact Susan Schleith at 321-638-1017 or at susan at fsec.ucf.edu. That video is a wonderful window into what Energy Wiz is. This statewide event attracts students from all across Florida and even from outside Florida's borders. Yet there are some students who aren't able to travel or have other challenges that require them to stay closer to home, to their homes. Energy Wiz Expos evolved when teachers and other community partners wanted to have similar but smaller, say two or three competition events, such as the Junior Solar Sprint or the Ener uh, Solar Energy Cook-Off. They wanted those closer to where they lived and work. The list here includes the city names of expo locations held in the past and hopefully these will continue on into the future. This is just a partial list of some of the, the things that come out of Energy Wiz. And really what I have heard from people who have attended or participated or been a volunteer is that after attending Energy Wiz, you feel hopeful and confident that this generation of students has the right stuff to meet the challenges of you know, climate change and the future. One of our um, PhD volunteers who likes to judge some of the projects said, he goes, this is so inspiring to me. I like to come every year because it's the, that shot in the arm, that boost that makes me feel like we are, we, we are on the right track to a better future. Every year we adjust Energy Wiz based on feedback from those who participate. We've learned so much about how to do this successfully. It takes sponsors and volunteers, teachers, students, community partnerships to make this happen. It is important to recognize and reward excellence. So we provide trophies and medallions to the top teams uh, and when sponsor dollars allow, we will also provide things like t-shirts or other giveaways to all the participants at Energy Wiz. One important lesson is that project-based learning really works, but it is important to give educators opportunities to learn about renewable energy technologies and how to implement these types of activities in the classroom. And we also try to make teachers' lives as easy as possible because they've got so much to do, they're overloaded, and this is just, sometimes they see this as one more thing. If we can show them they're able to kill many birds, birds with one stone by doing a project-based learning activity like a junior solar sprint or a critter comfort cottage, then it gives them ammunition. They can go to their administrator and say, look, we're doing this thing, and look at all the standards that we're covering by doing this. It helps them defend this somewhat messy approach to learning. 
So we're, we're happy to share any of our information about Energy Wiz so that if you would like to do something similar in your community, we can help you make this happen. We, we've got, we've done everything. We know what works, we know what doesn't work. We can help you identify sponsors. There's all sorts of things that we can help you with. Because what we believe, and I, I'm sure you kind of believe this too, or you wouldn't be <laughs> at this conference, is that the goal is energy literacy. And what we're trying to do is make the world a healthier and happier place for everyone and all living things. Thank you. Terrific. That was very inspiring. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I don't see any questions uh, given through the Q&A, but I do have one quick question. Um, when you're trying to sell this program to sponsors, is it an easy sell? Does this program kind of sell itself? Uh, usually what it takes is for someone to come one time and then they're, they're <clears throat> hooked usually. Um, so it, it has a lot of benefits in many different ways. Uh, definitely we get a lot of utility sponsors because they see this as promoting a workforce and uh, the STEM skills that are really required for the future um, in, in energy. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions and I know Susan ran a little bit over her time that I had suggested, so I think we might just move on. And let me uh, just say the, the order of the rest of the speakers because I think um, we may have published uh, data on this and I changed it after that. So next will be Dr. Wong, followed by Dr. Manzi, then uh, Lyra Rackison, then Johnny Weiss, then we'll end with John Essig. So let me introduce Dr. Wong. Dr. Julian Wong is an Associate Professor in Architectural Engineering and the Director of the Arca Lambda Laboratory at the Pennsylvania State University. He received a PhD in architecture from Texas A&M and Doctor of Engineering in Building Physics from Tianjin University. His current research focuses on the interdisciplinary applications of building science in sustainable, healthy, and interactive building environments. He is also a recipient of the NSF Career Award and the Illuminating Engineering Society's Richard Kelly Award. Dr. Wong, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I will share my screen. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be part of this uh, the Kitchen Grove presentation today. Um, for a long time, the knowledge and the skills related to solar energy have been taught in various approaches and different strategies across different disciplines. How can we make the, all the disciplinary educational pieces to be an integrated and a coherent one for educating next generation solar energy related professionals? This is the initial question we had and the motivation for our education effort presented in this work. My name is uh, Julian Wang. Uh, I am a associate professor in architecture engineering at the Penn State University. Today, using this presentation, entitled Bringing Solar Focus Knowledge into a Sustainable Building Course, I will share our solar cluster educating design and development at the Penn State University and focus on a specific course hosted in architecture engineering. Uh, firstly, I would like to explain why we bring uh, this solar focus education into Penn State University. On the one hand, at Penn State, we already have about six departments or schools offering solar related educational components, courses, seminars, certificates, etc., ranging from very basic introductory courses to advanced research courses. So, in total, um, we have about 20 solar related um, classes currently in PSU curriculum system. So we actually have a quite uh, diverse and a sufficient depth for solar related education right now. 
Uh, on the other hand, the required skills, the techniques, and the theory are very different across different uh, departments. For instance, you will find architecture design students. So they, they design very fancy building geometries and integrate solar envelopes. Students, students in building engineering work on calculating and simulating buildings of solar heat and light distributions and transmissions. Uh, electrical engineering students may work uh, on the circuit design and the microgrid integrating solar PV panels and the batteries. Uh, energy engineering students communicate a lot about the solar energy availability and the variations. Students, students majoring in uh, material science, uh, they learn the methods to develop new films, the coatings, to enhance the solar energy harvesting abilities. While uh, chemical engineering students, they, they talk about, they discuss the, the flexible solar cells and the battery design. So we have very different knowledge points and uh, uh, and the and the and the skill sets. So about ten instructors related to this uh, solar topic have met and uh, discussed a, a possibility of how we can integrate all these studies and the learning pieces into a whole with the necessary overlaps of basic knowledge and communication, but still maintaining the basic boundaries for the domain knowledge and uh, and the skill sets. We remap the existing curricular in uh, the different departments and majors, and, and developed uh, several uh, subclusters. And some courses design and redesign were performed after this group meeting, and, uh, so, and also we developed a subcluster uh, curriculum. The ultimate goal is to achieve something like this, shown in this diagram. Here, I provide our cross-disciplinary uh, solar curricula in the subcluster of solar and the building environment. I have been highly experienced in two disciplines, architecture design and architecture engineering, in terms of both educational background and teaching activities. This has enabled me to directly observe discrepancies and the inadequacies in both groups. However, in the complex, ever involving multidisciplinary field of the solar architecture, there is an urgent need, especially for these two disciplines, to produce graduates who not only have a high level expertise in their own specialties, but also some basic knowledge and skills regarding the specialties with which they interact. Some new contents were developed for each existing course in this subcluster. And some new courses were, were also added to fill in the gap that exists uh, between the students in this domain. I will particularly share one of the new courses in this list, uh, solar, solar Windows, the Heat and Light, uh, which we designed and taught in, in the past two years. This new course design is also partially supported by the educational component of a National Science Foundation project. And the reason why we added this course into this subcluster is that window, as an important facade element of architecture, constitutes crucial and attractive knowledge points to the next generation of the solar architecture professionals. Window design and engineering are not only about architectural aesthetics, but also have significant correlations to building energy because windows are normally more thermally and optically sensitive to external weather conditions. Meanwhile, the windows view and the daylighting have been demonstrated to be important and effective to affect indoor occupants of health, well-being, and productivity. Additionally, various emerging technologies in materials, engineering, and controls have been developed in this area in the past few years. So in brief, we believe this topic about solar and windows is essential to both design. I lost his screen. I was trying to figure out how to do mine again, and it, you know, I lost the screen. To design and engineer student communities. Yeah, it just really is. Yeah. This diagram shows uh, the key learning modules and oh, their principles in this course. We started with very basic knowledge of radiometry and the photometry. He made it and then we moved to uh, the media level, um, yeah, which is about uh, the heat and light aspects of the solar radiation. 
subsequently two primary receptors of the neuron and optical were introduced to link the prisoners' fundamental knowledge points and the song relation understandings. Then several computational um, techniques and uh, analytical models were offered to the students to enable them to integrate the other knowledge points from the solar architecture design perspective. On the parallel line, we also have a semester long team project, including some uh, in situ measurements and the computational design and analysis. So, this is about the in situ measurement learning module. The students learn how to simply use Arduino sensors to assemble a portable uh, and a small size measurement module and then use that to measure, use that to measure incident and a transmitted uh, solar radiance uh, through actual building visits and uh, real building windows. Um, this is to understand the spatial, uh, to understand the spatial, spectral, and temporal solar radiation features and their effects on the windows thermal and optical performance. Um, this, this is a semester long project or a game that we call it. Uh, was designed for students in this course. We intend to, to group students from different majors into several teams. In the first phase, the architecture students in each group will lead their team members to complete a simple design project. During this engineering, uh, during this process, the engineer students need to propose uh, solar-related energy efficient strategies and solutions. Then one will, one uh, was selected as a baseline model for the next phase. During this initial phase, uh, uh, the students majoring in different areas gain basic experience in communicating information and exchanging knowledge. The second phase, uh, that is the main part of this project, will follow and run till the end of the semester. All groups use the selected baseline model uh, from phase one and focus only on the building window components. Uh, especially about the selection, layer by layer, about the speed windows, the different layer materials, the films, and, uh, uh, and the structures. With the objective of minimizing energy use, which is about heat inputting and lighting, while still maintaining the architectural aesthetics of the building facade. The engineer students play an important role in this design development process using their skill sets in calculating and, uh, and, and analyzing uh, solar energy and uh, building energy related things. While the communications between majors are still necessary to deliver the goals in both the engineering and design, a project critique of the designs um, was conducted by, the invite, by invited uh, industry professionals from both design and engineering areas. The winner was the team with the best of scores, um, taking both facade design and uh, accumulated energy use into account. And, uh, get back to this diagram. So in this presentation, in this presentation, we provide uh, just an example in our solar cluster education design development consent, which is uh, is more to do with uh, cross disciplinary education between architecture design, uh, building engineering, and uh, some of them related to energy engineering. Uh, so ideally, the other subclusters are working on the same purposes uh, to bring all the educational pieces of the solar related education into a coherent whole. This is our ultimate goal of the solar focused education at Penn State. Thank you for your time for attending this uh, presentation. Thank you. So this is Elaine again, and um, we had a little bit of trouble. There was a little bit of echo on that presentation. Um, so I, I hope that people understood it well enough. It was recorded though. I think uh, the echoey might, might have gotten recorded as well. But does anybody have any questions for Dr. Wong? If you do, please type them into the Q&A because as a, uh, just as, as an attendee, we can't hear your voice. We just see what you type. So maybe um, I have a quick question. 
How many students do you think you've um, put through this program with the interdisciplinary uh, activities? Right, for, for, this, for this specific cluster, we, we, we are aiming to the students um, just in two groups, in the architecture design and the architecture engineer, the two departments. Uh, so we, uh, the first year we have about uh, 15 students and uh, last year we, we have, uh, I think it's just, just about 10 students. Um, but for the whole campus wise, uh, we're planning to have, uh, so, so now that each, each cluster is working on their own enrollment and also advertisement about the course design. And then we try to uh, increase this kind of inter interdisciplinary effort between the groups. Uh, so far, it's a, they just focus on this, in my part, they just focus on these two groups. Okay, I see a Q&A has popped up. What was the final project that students were making? Yeah, so it, it's, just, it's more uh, virtual. It's still about building model um, in the simulation. But we, we do have a two, uh, two phases. The first phase is uh, uh, the, the main motivation we had there is we want to see if we communicate based on our questions or project criteria. Um, so the first phase is led by um, architecture students because it's more to do with design and it's a model of a facade, a window placement, et cetera. And the second phase will be more, uh, is more about the, the, the simulation part. And uh, also the, and starting from very early, layer by layer, glazing system selection. So it's very a uh, simulation based and a software um, oriented uh, project. Okay. Um, there are more questions coming in, but in the interest of time, in case we have any technical difficulties going forward, I think I'm going to say, let's take the discussion to the post chat room for this session. And I think I'm just going to go ahead and introduce the next speaker. Um, sure. So thank you, Dr. Wong. You may stop sharing your screen. And next is Dr. Manzi. Our next speaker is Dr. Khaled Manzi. After earning a Bachelor of Science degree in architectural engineering at Cairo University and a master's in architecture and urban design at Helwan University, Cairo, he came to the United States and studied at the Illinois Institute of Technology, where he earned his PhD in architecture. Since 2012, he has been a professor in the School of Architecture at Oklahoma State University. Welcome, Dr. Manzi. Okay, now, um, Dr. Wong, you need to stop sharing your screen, I think, and Dr. Manzi needs to share his screen. Yeah, I think I already did. Okay, very good. Now, mute, please mute yourself. Anybody not speaking, please mute yourself. Dr. Manzi, ah, yes, I'm done. I see something. I'm there we go. Very good. Okay, thank you, Lynn, for the introduction. And as you see, the topic of this paper is carbon footprint in the design studio. And we think as the faculty teaching in this uh, studio, we think that this is gonna be actually a paradigm shift for us. So this is mainly for sharing information on what we currently do and then what we think we need to like change in the future, actually in, in the near future. So this is actually a report on our work in the studio and one um, graduate level independent study done by one of our students. So um, the authors here are like five. So the first actually is Abby Brandvold, who is one of our students actually who did the uh, one again independent study and she is now a graduate student at University of Texas. Uh, Austin. And the other four are actually the four faculty teaching the same uh, studio, so actually we'll co-teach the studio. So um, the studio is actually the comprehensive design studio and uh, the architecture program in Oklahoma State University. And in this studio, we try actually to cover a certain number of NAB uh, criteria. So the, the, um, what we're looking at right now is actually this holistic approach to building performance. 
we actually address building performance in the studio in, in a certain way and we found out that actually we need to change that uh, in, in actual response to the NAB uh, or the new NAB requirements like 2020 update of the NAB requirements for accreditation. So we're actually uh, doing that, we'll address these points of discussion. So what's integrative or comprehensive design? Uh, because this is uh, the actually the topic we cover in the studio and performance optimization, how we do it in the studio and how we need to change it in the future. Again, in response to the uh, need for climate action and climate action in this way actually means carbon footprint. And also we found that, that, that actually we need to do or add to the studio life cycle analysis as well. So we'll, we'll actually explain why is that. Okay, so again, the context of this is the uh, architecture program at Oklahoma State University. And actually this is the uh, second semester in the fourth year. This is actually where we uh, teach that the studios actually it's, uh, towards the end of the curriculum. And actually we used to call this studio some time ago, we used to call it the capstone studio. Then actually um, this one, it was actually uh, taught during the fifth year, but we moved it down. So actually it's not the uh, last studio student take anyway or anymore. So it is not really the capstone uh, studio but it is actually, we call it right now, the uh, center of gravity studio, just to give it a name. So it is actually, again, this is a studio, the second semester and the fourth year. And <coughs> in terms of uh, NAB accreditation, um, because actually this is why we are trying to make the change when I explain. The, in, in the NAB accreditation, they always like to see the uh, student um, criteria where it was actually uh, achieved at the highest level. So mainly because this studio is like a later studio in the curriculum and we address or follow up actually on the um, what the students learn in the previous um, um, studios and also lecture courses. So you see here like these are actually where we actually provide evidence to the uh, NAB accreditations always actually address the, the majority of the, the, the criteria. And for sure, the reason uh, for that is that, uh, again, this used to be the capstone studio, so everything comes together, but uh, we still actually treat it as a capstone studio. So the content really is, I would say, huge. There is lots of content we need to cover in this studio, including uh, performance. So coming up, but we're talking about uh, performance. So this is actually the, the studio. One thing also that allows us to address many topics in this studio is that uh, several years ago, we actually decided to make this a comprehensive semester, not only a comprehensive design studio, which means that we have actually the six hour studio. And when the students enroll in this course or in this studio, they have to actually to concurrently enroll in two other courses. So actually it is a bulk of 12 credit hours. So six hours in the studio we have one seminar and actually one of the uh, faculty who teach the studio, Professor Tom uh, Spector, actually teaches project management as also integrated with the studio. So that's actually allowed us to um, address many uh, of the topics we cover in the curriculum. And for sure students take structural systems and the uh, architectural science courses before that. So these are the prerequisite courses. Okay, in terms of performance. So the way we address performance in the studio is actually we look at these, these three different types of performance. So for sure we look at the energy performance or the environmental performance of the, the, the building structural performance and the cost uh, performance. So in the, I'm gonna talk about number two and the three here and then number one in another slide. So in, in terms of structural performance, actually students come up with different designs of structural systems and choose the best one that works for the project. And actually they are advised here by 
uh, Professor Phillips, who's actually the professor teaching structural systems in our program, or one of the uh, professors who teaches structural systems. So uh, you look at actually, typically you look at three different uh, alternative systems like timber, steel, concrete, and then they choose the, the one that works the best uh, for the project. So this is how we cover structural performance. And the cost performance actually do cost estimating of the construction and also project management, how they manage this project in a, in a, in a real office. And uh, I have to say here that although we address like cost performance, but there is no set construction budget. They just, the students need to calculate the budget just to be aware of what is the impact of their design decisions on the budget. Okay, so this is for energy uh, performance. And this is actually what I teach in the studio. So I'm responsible for the environmental uh, performance aspect of design in this studio. So we look at actually code compliance, electric lighting, the lighting and uh, cooling load. So in code compliance, we know that you can comply with the code, the ECC code, International Energy Conservation Code based on two different alternatives. We can actually comply based on the prescriptive values or performance. So if you comply based on performance, actually you have at least to uh, achieve 15% per, per energy savings and integrate electric lighting, the lighting and uh, cooling load. I'm gonna also explain this later. So in terms of lighting, in terms of performance of electric lighting, we look at the for sure the recommended uh, illuminance in the space and what is the uh, light load and we use this light load actually in the calculations for the cooling load and the lighting actually students um, uh, build the models and test these under the artificial sky dome actually we have a the lighting lab in which the students do that and they come up with the distribution of illumination in that one space and also the uh, what is the average illuminance at the design condition okay so <clears throat> one more thing here was the uh, the uh, energy analysis so we do this actually during the design development phase so uh, we actually give them enough time give the students enough time during the dd phase to uh, come up with this analysis of uh, energy performance in terms of cooling load or actually the energy use uh, intensity of the entire building. So what they do actually is that they start with uh, a baseline, which is the code compliant uh, model. And then actually have to keep uh, testing their design iterations till they reach the final design, keeping track of what is the energy index of that. And this is only uh, like um, the results of the studio. So uh, this is like in this studio actually we had like 40 students in different groups. And uh, this is how actually we track if they comply with the code based on prescriptive values here or based on performance. So, and this is actually the second aspect of energy performance, which is uh, calculation of the peak lo cooling load. And then this is actually a measure of the uh, um, equipment sizing and duct sizing and so on. This is actually the, the important slide that I wanna share and talk about with you, which is actually, this is the work Abby did uh, in the uh, spring 2019. And we did exactly what we do in the studio. So this is energy use index. We keep track of that. And this is for three different design iterations. So if we make a decision, I want to actually choose one of these three different iterations. The, uh, obviously, this is the best one because this actually saves 18.8% energy compared to the baseline. But when actually we pair this with the cost comparison, so it's much more expensive, mainly because of the aluminum uh, external shading here. And actually from only the financial point of view, from the investment point of view, it has actually a negative return on investment. So actually there is contradiction here between what is the best decision from the energy point of view or what's the best decision from the cost point of view. And 
we actually uh, also in this case, we used the uh, Athena uh, impact estimator to give us the uh, impact in terms of kilograms of CO2 equivalent. And this is also a big problem for this design iteration. So this is one added aspect of performance. And actually this led us to think, okay, so if we are previously, actually I'm gonna go back to this, previously we're only making decisions based on energy performance and that's it. And then added to it like some cost analysis, but this is really very troubling uh, comparison here mainly because adding the aluminum uh, external shading actually um, uh, resulted in huge increase in the global warming potential. So um, then the question became, how can we actually bring this global warming potential uh, into the picture? And how can we also, instead of making decisions based on energy performance only, actually make decisions based on the uh, global warming uh, potential? So just, and then uh, if we actually uh, go back and see at the, or look at the uh, macro perspective, like what's happening in the uh, profession, you look at, we know that the profession is trying actually to reach zero energy by the year 2030. This is like what EIA was partnership with architecture 2030 is trying to do, right? So this is actually a good success in terms of operational energy only. But we know also that even with this like ability to um, stabilize the uh, energy consumption for the uh, buildings, current buildings in the US. So this is actually even with adding new buildings, but we know that this is most of probably will not be able to reach 2030 by like the, the zero energy by 2030 because there is no enough actually savings to get all of this to zero. But actually the other problem also is that when we look at then the life cycle of the building, we know that all of what we're doing actually regarding operation and energies only represents only one phase of the uh, life of the building. So if one actually includes like all of the um, carbon emitted by the building, we have to include all of the phases of the building. And this is actually what we're trying to do here was like coming up with one measure that we need to use to make decisions. So this would be the basis for uh, decision making because it includes not only the operational energy but also the embodied energy for the other phases of the building. And this is actually the last slide here. And one interesting uh, result actually or conclusion is that since we are looking at three different measures of performance, energy structural performance, and we'll add also the carbon footprint to that. Actually, this uh, looks like a very good um, comprehensive way of looking at the performance of buildings because we're not only like considering the uh, operational energy here, but we'll actually look at the share of buildings out of the, ind the industrial, which is manufacturing of materials and the transportation as well. So we typically, when we start with the students at the very beginning, we show them, them this pie chart and we only focus on operational energy only, but again, with the use of life cycle analysis and looking at the different uh, phases here, I should be able to cover 100% of the um, impact of buildings on the environment and the economy as well. And thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back on what I said earlier and say that you can put questions in the chat section. And I'm going to uh, encourage the speakers to look at the chat section, uh, click on the chat below and answer some questions, uh, typing it in. Uh, we do have one question. Uh, from Paul Henshaw, what software was used to model sun lighting slash shading? We use actually the energy simulation program EQUEST, which EQUEST. is actually uh, done by the government, very uh, accurate. Uh, um. Okay, terrific. All right, uh, I'm going to move us on. And so thank you. If you would unshare. And um, next up is. Lyra Rackison. 
Lyra has over 20 years of pioneering programs in renewable energy training, workforce development, outreach, and collaborative policy development. She founded and teaches North Carolina State University's Graduate Certificate in Renewable Energy Assessment and Development, a 100% online program. She is currently back in her hometown of Manila, Philippines. And so she's here with us live. I, I'm not sure if she's gonna be able to answer questions. I know it's like 2.30 in the morning for her, but um, we'll make sure you're able to um, get hold of her and hopefully uh, at least type in some questions in the chat area and she'll be looking, I hope. <laughs> so let me, and I'm gonna run. Sorry, say that again. Oh, okay, terrific. I'll be here. And I am going to share my screen because I have your presentation. So give me a moment here. All right, let me see if this works. Hello, everyone. Today, I will talk about online academic programs for renewable energy and why I think it's time has come. I'm Lyra Dumdum Rackison, and this is my presentation. So a few things about me. I started the training programs at the NC Clean Energy Technology Center, formerly the Solar Center, in 2004 with the launch of the Renewable Energy Technologies Diploma Series. Sometime in 2005, I co-wrote a white paper with the university's College of Natural Resources, basically to convince them to offer a graduate level credit program in renewable energy. Um, then in 2017, I left the Clean Tech Center uh, to move to this beautiful island of Zanzibar in Tanzania. And while I was there, we got word that NC State had green-lighted the graduate certificate as a distance ed program. So that really worked out for me. That program was soon launched as the Graduate Certificate Course in Renewable Energy Assessment and Development. It's conveniently 100% online, especially helpful when there's a time difference. It offers academic credit, so a qualified grade can be credited towards a master's degree. Now, as we were looking around for similar or comparable programs, it appeared to us that there were not many graduate credit conferring programs on renewable energy development topics. It could be because universities have traditionally centered on academic and research-based programs, but perhaps we need to evaluate that strategy. As I go through this 10-minute presentation, I will hopefully show that there is a market for online renewable energy programs that offer college and most especially graduate credit. Now let's take a look at some of the trends. We're the fastest growing. We already had a feeling about this, but the trend was confirmed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In a news release last September 2019, solar and wind technicians were projected to be the top two growth areas ahead of healthcare jobs, and that's projected from 2018 to 2028. We also know that renewable energy is a desired field. Other sectors in energy want to join the renewable energy industry. It's a perceived growth area, and the Global Energy Talent Index reports in 2019 that 42% of oil and gas professionals would consider a move to renewables in the next three years. 42%. In the next three years, and this study was released before oil tanked this year. So imagine what that number would be like now. And then if we look at the power industry, which has traditionally been stable and loyal, 81% of the respondents said they would consider switching sectors. Of those, 47% of power sector professionals would move to a renewables job for its green credentials, followed by 40% moving to the oil and gas sector because of the pay. So let me reiterate again that this was before the negative oil prices. 
Now let's take a look at the profile of the renewable energy worker. If you want to go way back and look back when solar was $100 per watt, solar and the hippie culture were tight. In fact, in 1978, solar energy pioneer and idealist John Schaefer sold his first photovoltaic panel to a cannabis farmer. It all made sense. You know, you need to be off the grid but still require power. It was expensive, but these farmers could afford it. So it was a symbiotic relationship. And now, when I started in the in and when I started in the industry in 2004, I've met several entrepreneurs in the bleeding edge. They did everything. Here we see Bob and Maria Kingery. They started an energy company in North Carolina. And they were one of the handful of players back then. And in 2004, the NC Solar Center launched the first Diploma Series week-long workshop. And that was really to support folks like Bob, the guys who did it all. They were hands-on, they were entrepreneurial, and they got down and dirty and did everything. From accounting to installing, marketing, they did everything. And so our workshops back then were tailored to, to the Bob and, King, Bob and Maria Kingeries of the world. So for all those years, many training organizations like SEI and the North Carolina Clean Tech Center at NC State provided training. In 2008, because of the Great Recession, a lot of stimulus money went into developing the renewable energy sector. And it provided funding to develop train the trainer programs. You know, the Department of Energy had the Solar Instructor Training Network, which has now evolved into the Solar Training Network. Vocational schools and continuing education centers were tapped to provide solar training to instructors, um, now to vets and uh, AHJs or authorities having jurisdiction, so that the nation could train more of these folks, solar technicians, inspectors, and code officials. And that's because the industry has been really booming. And boom, we did. We know that we just don't need installers and technicians. The industry already works with many lawyers and accountants and bankers and such. And there are more of these professionals with college degrees who want to move up and move to our industry to contribute to what many perceive to be a personal and professionally fulfilling work environment. Many want to learn how to speak our language, so to speak. How do how we got here in the first place is because we provided the opportunity to learn about renewable energy and not just how to install, but how the cogs of the industry work. From the technical aspects of designing a PV system to understanding policy and how it can affect the bottom line. The lucky ones learned on the job. After all, it's quite rare to graduate with a renewable energy miner. But how about those, say, in the oil and gas sector who want to shift to renewables? Some are able to do that seamlessly and find a job, but others want or need to build academic credential. What then? So it brings me finally to this point. How do we meet a growing need for training a college graduate type person? Well, for the most part, we're already doing these things. Renewable energy training programs across the U.S. has a wide range of subjects from STEM to business to policy. And there are a lot of these existing already. A lot of those programs already offer those workshops online. It's a hands down the most logical way to deliver knowledge to those who need maximum, maximum flexibility. And of course, as we know, Learning at the time of corona almost always will have an online component to it. But then there is a market that training providers haven't quite filled out yet. And we all know this because we've gotten this question before. Does this workshop go towards my degree? Now, I'm not talking about engineering and research type subjects related to renewable energy. I'm talking about professional programs similar to the continuing education programs already offered, but ones that provide academic credits, something that leads to a college or a graduate degree. Academia tends to be rigid in what type 
of courses to offer and who can teach in their universities. But I think if universities open their colleges to offer these types of programs, they can attract college graduates and graduate students from all kinds of disciplines to explore their options in the renewable energy industry. And the industry in return will have a variety of professionals from different backgrounds ready and able to jump right into the exciting world of renewable energy. So in conclusion, I propose that it is time for four-year educational institutions to offer online courses and certificate programs in renewable energy topics that provide undergraduate and graduate academic credit. I thank you for your time. Okay, now I'm on, uh, unmuted myself. Um, thank you, that was uh, quite inspiring. Uh, are there any questions? Let me go to the Q&A and see if there's anything there. Okay, how about the chat? Not seeing any questions for Lyra, um, but I'll give you another few seconds to type something in in case. So Lyra, you're able to do this from the Philippines because it's remote learning. Yes, that is true. And actually when everyone kind of switched to online learning and working from home, I was like, ah, oh, nothing changed for me. All right, here's a question from Dorothy Gehring. What kind of degree work do you think these courses should fit? So, I have a lot of students who come from different backgrounds, actually. I have a few engineering students. Um, there's the public policy, someone who's taking her, her um, MPA, um, folks who are already lawyers, um, and so, or you know, someone who is studying to be a lawyer. Um, and basically, you know, it really attracts those who are already in grad school or and any like, you know, uh, electives or people who are already who graduated college or even taken their, you know, finished their master's degree, but are, you know, one of those lifelong learners. And instead of just wanting a continuing education program, and wants a credit program. Um, and this is, you know, I, I, I love the continuing ed concept actually and um, I fully support it and it reaches a lot more people um, but there are just these tiny there, there is a population out there that hasn't really been served um, who want the type of continuing ed programs but they want the academic credit so that's kind of like the niche that I hope that we're able to fill in the industry okay good and then she says, how do you think that these people would find these courses? Yeah, so right now, you know, we've actually heard a few programs, um, they're science-based. We don't have, I, I haven't really seen a lot of um, renewable energy development programs and you really have to know what to look for. And I don't even know if people know they exist. So. For us, is we, we, we do a lot of, um, NC State will do a lot of kind of outreach to their graduates or their alumni. Um, but there isn't, you know, so now we're just ramping it, it up. It was just launched a year ago. So ramping it up, we're trying to get more people to know that the, the program exists. Hopefully more programs like this pop up and people know that, that they exist. I'm hoping that maybe ACES can help. Maybe ACES can help spread yes. the word, uh, along with a, num a number of other education programs, some of which we've heard and will hear about today. So, okay, I think we're going to move on to the next speaker. Um, thank you, Lyra. All right, Johnny Weiss is an educator, certified industrial trainer, consultant, 
and solar building professional. I want to share my screen. With more than 40 years experience in real world application. Yeah, mute yourself for just a moment because we can hear you. <laughs> Let me finish introducing you. He has more than 40 years experience in real world applications of renewable energy. Johnny co-founded Solar Energy International, SEI, in 1991. As executive director, he led SEI for over 20 years, helping establish it as a leader in solar training. He is currently on its board of directors. Johnny is now particularly interested in solar electricity generating projects that are sustainable, international, and socially worthwhile. Currently, he's focused on helping to develop solar training centers in Tanzania and on Native American reservations. I can't resist this. Here's Johnny. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Okay, and greetings. This presentation is titled Success Factors for Developing Solar Training Centers. Uh, it's particularly important these days because of the climate emergency. We've now got an urgent challenge. Um, it's, a, it's, it's really time to go to scale. And that's a, that's a very challenging thing. And we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit today, I hope. Okay, the six factors for developing quality, quality solar PV training centers. And I'm focused on PV training here, and I'm focused on vocational PV training, practical hands-on nuts and bolts training for electricians, for designers, for installers, for maintenance people, all the way from standalone systems up to, up to, up to microgrid and utility scale as well. So, okay, here are the, here are the, here are the factors. We've got, first of all, we need quality facilities. We need a kid, accreditation and certification programs to give, to give credibility. We need strategic partnerships. We need to involve more women and get diversity going a lot better. We need appropriate curriculum and we need dedicated full-time professionals to, to uh, offer these services. Okay. My perspective is coming from Solar Energy International, SEI, here in Peonia, Colorado. Um, we started this almost 30 years ago now, and uh, it's all about uh, trying to figure out how to go to scale now. Uh, if the Green New Deal happens, it's going to be a very exciting time for all of us, for sure. Okay, so that's factor number one. We need a quality facility. Quality facilities need to be permanent, affordable, accessible, and perhaps we need housing for students as well as instructors. Uh, SEI has focused on outdoor lab yard training. This simulates practical real world conditions. Um, Hands-on is just a critically important part of vocational training. Uh, we'll talk about online and alternate delivery a little bit too. And boy, they're, they're, they're are making a tremendous contribution now. But to really get technicians uh, comfortable, we're gonna have to do uh, hands-on training as well. It's a particular challenge these days. Okay, so an outdoor facility has to, has to simulate real world conditions, right? Safety needs to be an important part of all vocational training and part of a, creating a quality facility. Okay, part of quality facilities need to include classrooms, obviously. And these days, that's not as simple as a chalkboard anymore. We need to have a, a fast internet service. We need to have a audio visual capability, reliable internet. That's all part of creating a quality facility these days. Okay, let's move to success factor number two. How do we ensure quality control? And, and, and you can see the, the center of my, uh, uh, of this of this pyramid holding up quality control is training. Well, that's, that's my background, that's where I'm coming from. But these days, in order to ensure quality control, we also have to have accreditation. And accreditation means that we're certifying programs, certifying organizations to do quality training. We're also certifying master trainers these days too. And that's a different accreditation process. Along with accreditation and training, now we need certification and certification has come a long way in the last decade and a half as well. Nowadays though, for big picture success, we've really got to integrate a fourth one. I need to change this slide ultimately because industry support is gonna be really critical to building quality training centers. Okay, us trainers, we like to provide a record of completion, not a formal certification, but a record of completion. I think that's the role of training organizations. This independent accreditation, we're really lucky to have IREC. 
the Interstate Renewable Energy Council has done a great job, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with IREC. They're, they give us credibility and accountability, oversight, and this whole accreditation process. As Solar Energy International, we offer different certificate programs so that people can take different directions with their renewable energy education. But independent certification is now offered by NABCEP, the North American Board of Certified Ener Energy Practitioners. And we really value the credibility that it gives all of us to have third party certification. We don't want the, the fox in charge of the hen house. We don't want trainer, training to be certifying itself. We want this quality control to be a part of a whole program that includes accreditation, training, certification from a third party, as well as now industry support. Okay, success factor number three, strategic partnerships. And us educators need to form strategic partnerships with equipment manufacturers, the OEMs. We need to connect with the regional hardware distributors. We need to connect and work closely with the local installing dealers. And we need to, of course, connect with non-governmental organizations overseas and everywhere. And of course, we need government agency support, which is, uh, which is coming to. Okay, there's a lot of major players right now and uh, companies are doing well. There's a whole corporate connection with all this now. And we're seeing increased support from, from, from the manufacturers who want to see their equipment uh, installed and used as training as part of uh, all of our, all of our hands-on training programs. Okay, success factor number four, we don't need to spend too much time on, it's in the news quite a bit these days, but of course we need to, a commitment, a renewed commitment to involve women and to promote diversity in our training programs. That's all of our responsibility. Women's involvement, creating opportunities and Personally, uh, it's certainly time for, uh, I believe, for real affirmative action in this regard. Uh, typically, historically at SEI, we've had 20% participation by women in these nuts and bolts, practical hands-on courses. We need to increase that. And we see that happening slowly, but not fast enough for some of us. It's time to move that to a front burner. And I'm sure most of us agree. Okay, success factor number five is all about, um, uh, is all about uh, appropriate curriculum. And we don't need to spend much time on this, but there's factors that are involved in this. We need, the considerations include cultural, technical, and the duration of training programs. Things need to be customized. What we're doing now with the Red Cloud Renewable uh, Energy Center on the Pine Ridge Indian Bay Reservation, working with Henry Red Cloud, a Lakota, uh, a Lakota leader, we need to do different curriculum up there. We need to make this culturally appropriate. We need to adapt it so that it works for this particular culture. And, and that's a challenge, but it's also a very rewarding one for us too. Likewise, with the work I'm doing in Tanzania now, with, with SEI and with other volunteers, um, working with Rukusu, the Rural Community Support Organization. This is an SEI alumni who's working very hard to create a training center. We need to do things very special for that. And when it comes to end user training, we really need to work very differently. We need to create uh, uh, all kinds of models. For example, teaching battery state of charge using a balloon with with folks that are unfamiliar with, uh, with battery technology. Likewise, in our program in, in Costa Rica, we need to adapt things, not just translate things, but make them culturally appropriate and make the experience culturally appropriate for people that want to learn, learn renewable energy and particularly PV technology. Okay, workbooks, translation, it's gonna be a big job to take this on a global level. We've got great graphics now that are gonna help a lot. We've got all kinds of things that can, that can really improve things along. Alternate delivery, online training, uh, it's really happening now in a big way the last few months and it's gonna continue to make a, a terrific contribution. Um, okay, the last factor is uh, dedicated full-time staff. And that's a pretty obvious one. We need committed people and we're lucky in solar that we have so many people like ACES have been here for, for so long are an inspiration to all of us. Okay, the demand is going nuts. Uh, particularly for PV right now. So, so what's the plan to scale things? Well, we got to improve our current systems. That's obvious. We got to grow the instructor base. We got to train trainers. We got to embrace new delivery technology, virtual reality, everything. We've got to embrace that strongly and we need to strengthen these partner relationships. So, okay, 
in conclusion, that's it. It's time to get together and to uh, develop world-class training centers throughout the world that can get the job done in the important coming time. Thank you again. All the best. Thanks, Johnny, for your dynamic presentation there. Uh, let's see if we have any questions or in the chat or the Q&A. Let's see here, nothing there. All right, I'm seeing uh, nothing at the moment. Um, so Johnny, where else, Costa Rica, Tanzania, Native American lands in the US, are you doing Native Americans in any other continent? Well, um, you, could, you could count the indigenous folks in Tanzania as, a, as an yep. indigenous community, but yep. we're also doing a program in, uh, in Oman right now. In, in the, in the, uh, in, uh, that's an exciting program that's taking off. Um, and we're assisting other, other programs uh, all, all over. Trying to get some consistency and trying to get them culturally appropriate is, is a big challenge, but, uh, but, but it's, a, it, it's a wonderful opportunity as well. Dorothy's asking, are you working with SEI now? Yeah, I'm on the board of directors of SEI. I'm, I consider myself the co-flounder, as we say. That was 30 <laughs> years ago. SEI was my idea way back when, but uh, we put together a great team, and SEI is thriving right now and, and able to do well because it has such an extensive online program. But we do miss the online classes, which we hope we'll be able to resume uh, uh, later this summer. She also says, I use the SEI book and it hasn't been updated for a lot of years. The graphics are quite old. Have you updated? Yes, maybe uh, she can send me a note and I'll be glad to uh, see that she can get access to, uh, to, uh, to the newer textbook. I'm not sure which one she's operating on now, but uh, we do update it periodically. But updating this information is a challenge for us educators. Um, but, uh, but the new book, I'm very proud of the graphics in. So perhaps she's working on the old one. Right. And I, I took an SEI class, oh, many, many moons ago. <laughs> I don't know if I still have the workbook. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I am not seeing anything else. So I think we're going to move on to our final speaker. And then if there's time after him, uh, we will uh, have some more questions. So Johnny, stop sharing. You can, uh, yep, do the top of the screen. Stop sharing your screen. And I will introduce our last speaker, John Essig. With over three decades of experience as a research and development engineer, Mr. Essig is currently working to develop cost favorable, zero net energy buildings, carbon neutral transportation systems, and fully sustainable, resilient communities. In his current role as director of the US Environmental Initiative, USEI, Mr. Essig is also exploring ways to maximize both individual and national security using distributed renewable energy systems coupled with storage, aggressive demand management, and smart microgrids. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering from the U of Virginia and is also a practicing certified passive house consultant. Here's John. So John, are you there? And can you share your screen? John Essig. I can. I am here. Excellent. I'll mute myself now. And here we go. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Also, thank you, Elaine, for the introduction and to the whole of the ACES team and staff for making this event possible. And frankly, I also want to wish uh, to thank the uh, other presenters of this session, as well as those uh, two preceding sessions, uh, who've actually made my job a whole lot easier. Thank you very much, uh, both by sharing their perspectives and also by adding a lot of uh, valuable context. So today I want to discuss efforts to create a global task force to tackle climate change by way of establishing an international clean energy core. And I also want to address, of course, the critically important role of education that uh, Johnny just touched on, as did others. But time is short, CO2 is still rising, so by all means, let's get started. So mission, as uh, someone mentioned this morning, a good planet is hard to find. And we know we need to make some changes and make them quickly. So the idea of the clean energy core and the 
mission of the Clean Energy Corps is indeed to uh, mobilize the citizens of planet Earth to create a truly sustainable, resilient, peaceful, prosperous, enlightened, healthy, and just world for all. And then as a particular special note here, in the uh, wake of the you know, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the uh, global economic disaster that that's precipitated on the US and uh, other nations around the world, such an international clean energy core or similar project could serve as a very highly effective tool for uh, providing jobs to those who, who need one, both to make uh, contributions for present day society, but uh, also for future generations through uh, climate change. And frankly, it's quite akin to the Civilian Conservation Corps that was established during the uh, Great Recession nearly 100 years ago. So let's talk briefly about a strategy. So one of the main things I think we need to do because it's a very large job is we need to empower and deputize citizens. I mean, governments and industry and academia and non-governmental organizations have done so much, can do so much uh, to combat climate change, but certainly not everything. So success is also gonna depend heavily on our choices and our actions. So ultimately we need to all ask ourselves, what can we do for ourselves? What can we do for our communities? And what can we do for our planet? And these aren't choices of things to choose from. Hopefully we can come up with solutions that are uh, highly synergistic and benefit all three of those spheres. Uh, next, uh, and this is really the core of what we need to talk about is, at present is to establish globally accessible uh, education. And Johnny just did a great presentation and shows how that, is, uh, how that potentially can be done. But I think it's critically important that we do this. And to do that, we really need to eliminate a lot of the unnecessary barriers. So prohibitive costs, schedule conflicts, long distances, language barriers, cultural barriers, et cetera. Um, in the US, things may be affordable to many, uh, but some of the programs that might be available are going to be far less uh, accessible financially, for example, to folks in different parts of the world. So we could potentially also ask or demand of, you know, Madam University President or Mr. Dean of Students to uh, please tear down these walls, if you will. So the next step is to really take direct community action. So you know, once we have all these uh, well-trained folks, um, we just need to put them to action because uh, that's the only way that we're actually gonna reduce the net uh, you know, carbon emissions and environmental uh, impact. Then we also, as we go out and work around the world, as we work across the country, uh, we all need to be very mindful to collect and then share best practices and uh, to localize them around the world. Uh, language translations, cultural appropriateness, uh, et cetera. And the last but not least, we really need to be a collaborating organization, not a competing one. We want to build bridges uh, that can connect all of us. So education and training. Well, it's hard to underestimate, or excuse me, overestimate the importance of education. As uh, Nelson Mandela had mentioned, Many years ago, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Well, I agree. And I think it's also our best tool to fight climate change, along with, of course, racism and so many other gross injustices that Mandela had intended. So moving on to education and training more specifically and uh, some proposed uh, programs. So first are online classes. Uh, and we've just heard several presentations that mentioned uh, the, the need and value for these. And I think I also agree that they're the lowest cost, easiest way to reach people everywhere and also facilitates localization into multiple languages and regions. Uh, next, uh, we'd like to work with collaborating institutions, uh, university classes and labs. Um, but as uh, uh, Lyra pointed out, one key is that uh, folks also have the ability to earn academic credit and prof uh, professional certification, such as uh, a NAVSET certification. So for a deeper dive, if someone wants to do a more intensive learning experience, summer learning institutes and semester abroad, uh, semester abroad programs are something that we would very much like to see. And then ultimately it comes to hands-on training. So to supplement the classroom and lab work, one needs uh, hands-on training to develop a certain uh, level of mastery. Then once we get a bunch of these uh, citizens and other folks uh, trained up and ready to go, uh, 
we can partake in a lot of community service projects, you know, to get additional hands-on experience. And this is something that should be open to all. So there could be a range of local to international projects. These could be service learning projects, uh, service travel projects. Very much like Habitat for Humanity, uh, similar to what Doctors for uh, Doctors Without Borders does for its um, you know, medical crews, and but for climate action. And I also realize there's folks like Grid Alternatives who are also doing a wonderful job of doing similar things like this in the States. Um, but how do we take that model and take it global? And then lastly, I think it's really valuable to do some end-to-end -end, uh, project-based learning and uh, akin to what is known as a CDIO initiative uh, from my or perspective. So real briefly, for those who are not familiar with CDIO, it stands for Conceive, Design, Implement, and Operate. It, or operate. it was created about uh, two and a half decades ago by uh, a few university professors who were looking for a better way to train engineers. And they wanted to come up with a curriculum that actually stressed teaching a real world system and design engineering by way of conceiving, designing, implementing, and operating uh, you know, real world projects. So it's an excellent global model for rigorous project-based learning. The concept can be expanded beyond engineering to all disciplines. And I think it's a pretty solid framework uh, for uh, energy core projects as uh, well as other programs uh, that people might wanna do worldwide. Um, it's also a really good demonstrated model for sharing best practices worldwide. So over the past two plus decades, uh, there's now over 120 institutions on six continents. So I think we can do a similar global collaboration for solar and energy efficiency, renewable energy education. And I really think that the fundamentally resource sharing seems vital to globally accessible education. So public outreach. Okay, this is where things get difficult because COVID-19 got in the way of everything this past year, or at least past six months um, for many of us. So there's kind of two uh, areas of public outreach programs. And most of this is the pretty much standard fare. It's just that some is pre-COVID and some is post-COVID. So mission-focused webinars, uh, virtual solar tours, digital newsletters, online media campaigns, things of that nature. And then there's sort of a big red line. So upon getting a COVID-19 vaccine or an effective therapeutic or achieving herd immunity, then there's a whole bunch of uh, additional traditional outreach programs that are typically the bread and butter of uh, any organization that's trying to communicate with the public. So lecture series, public festivals, fun runs and the like, mission focused social events, uh, and of course uh, expanded and enhanced uh, solar tours. So a combination of learning, but also fun and community building. So one popular community outreach program has been the solar tour. Um, we like to say where neighbors teach neighbors how to save planet Earth. On the right here is an example brochure from a solar tour in the Washington DC area from a few years ago. Uh, this year will mark the 30th year for the DC solar tour, the 25th year for the national solar tour. Please sign up everyone. And coming soon, uh, we hope to launch a world solar tour, extending this to different uh, countries and in different languages. And in general, the Clean Energy Corps will try to replicate proven models globally. So on a community action, once again, this is gonna be split up by what we can do post COVID versus pre COVID uh, resolution. Uh, number of standard type things that can be done here, but for starters, uh, we can do a community energy census. Uh, for us to know how much we must reduce, we must first know how much we're actually using. Uh, expand Solarize, solar co-op, community solar programs. They seem to be uh, quite popular for getting a high um, participation rate in communities, and then uh, community-based sustainability competitions and design contests, something that can be done remotely. Once again, after that red line, uh, we hope to do direct support of community solar installations, residential and commercial solar installations. Um, these could be for solar co-ops, nonprofits, seniors, et cetera, but then also support uh, neighborhood energy efficiency retrofits. Next step for the Clean Energy Corps itself, hey, we need to uh, officially establish the um, organization as a nonprofit and establish key uh, partners uh, relationships, um, secure and operationalize all resources, so business systems, facilities, et cetera, and then just commence operations with a few key programs. And ultimately, we need to just start building a global task force needed to create a truly sustainable world for all. 
Uh, it's a big job. It's going to take a lot of humans. So all are invited. All are welcome. And then there's a couple of steps we can take real quickly as we wrap up here that all I think all citizens can do right now, all earthlings can do right now. And that is make green choices, take green action everywhere and with everyone we can. So whether you're doing it individually, family or friends, colleagues, neighbors, um, community worldwide or some point in between, uh, we can all take action. So we're here to help every step of the way. I think we're stronger together. Then one final perspective, we're back here. And I would just say, if you were zipping through the cosmos and you stumbled across this planet, what might you say? Well, what would this guy say? Hey, earthlings, I would suggest, I don't know how we translate that exactly, uh, but you've got a great planet. And there's caveat, if you can keep it. I say, let's not mess this one up. So, on behalf of all citizens of planet Earth, one giant big green thank you. And I'd be happy to take any questions or recommendations or discuss uh, collaboration opportunities with folks in the future. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, John. Um, we're getting the, uh, the, the hook to be pulled off stage here. Our uh, techie needs to go do another session. And so I think let's just move to the post session uh, networking lounge. There's a, a place for this session, the education session. Thank you, everybody. The speakers were awesome. Thank you. Um, we will see you in the networking lounge and other places on the conference. Thank you, everybody. Bye now. Sounds great. Thank you so much, everyone. Good job.